And with that, I'll ask everybody to remain muted from this point. Today's reference garden is the Green Bay Botanical Garden. Mark Conluck is the Director of Horticulture. Today's presenters are Kate Miller and Jean Arnett. Jean sent me a little bit of background information uh, for you to have before we get going. The, the uh, reference garden is now in its eighth full year. Many of us remember going there for a regional meeting. There are 495 cultivars in the dwarf conifer garden. And Jean says that uh, this year, phase three of the garden was completed. And this will likely be the last expansion. And get ready to put those questions in chat because he states the only disease issue they have continues to be pine scale, which many of us can relate to. Uh, they're gonna give a brief highlight of the Green Bay Botanical Garden, overview of the conifers, and then a virtual tour, which as we know, the slides of the other presentations has been magnificent. So we're all looking forward to it. With that, Kate, I will turn it over to you. Sounds good, thank you. Can everybody hear me? We can hear you fine. Yep, okay. Well, thank you for joining us today for the virtual tour of the Green Bay Botanical Garden featuring the Arndt Conifer Garden. Um, we are happy to be part of this series of tours and we've enjoyed the previous presentation. So we hope you enjoy ours as well and it gets you excited to come visit us. Um, I'll start the presentation today highlighting some of the other areas of the Green Bay Botanical Garden and then I will pass things on to Jean to give some history of the Arndt Conifer Garden as well as a tour of the Arndt Conifer Garden. And I meant to introduce myself. My name is Kate Miller. I'm a horticulturist here at the garden and I help to take care of the Arn Conifer Garden. I'm joined with Jean Arn today, who is a garden donor as well as a member and volunteer. He also serves as our sponsor for the um, National Conifer Society. I also wanna take this opportunity to let everybody know about an upcoming exhibit we have this year, 2021. It's called Washed Ashore, Art to Save the Sea. And it is made up of nine larger than life sculptures that are of sea animals. They're all made of plastics that are reclaimed from our ocean shores. And it is aimed to educate the public about the rising problem of plastic um, pollution in our waterways. So that runs from May 8th to September 26th. So plenty of time to get out to see that as well. So the Northeast Wisconsin's Conifer Reference Garden is located on the grounds of the Green Bay Botanical Garden here in Green Bay, Wisconsin. We are a nonprofit public garden and we're celebrating our 25th year this year. So we're really excited about that. We're gonna have events and celebrations throughout the whole year commemorating that birthday, as well as all of the donors, volunteers, sponsors, friends and visitors that have gotten us to the point we're at today. And this garden was came about as an idea of a small group of dedicated people whose passion for horticulture, they wanted to share with the community and create a space for learning and enjoyment. So ground was broken on the Emil and Gail Fisher Visitor Center in 1994. The first garden was installed in 1996, two years later. So 25 years later, Green Bay Botanical Garden has become the second most frequented tourist attraction um, with only the Green Bay Packers facility receiving more annual visitors. So that's according to TripAdvisor and something we're very proud of and excited about as well. So currently our 47 acre garden consists of 23 and a half acres of cultivated gardens. The other 23 and a half acres are areas that we still may develop as well as natural areas. And here's just some aerial views. You can kind of see, we collectively call this area, these areas are upper gardens. Um, you can kind of see the overall design and how each garden leads into and is connected to one another. 
So when you exit the visitor center and enter the garden, you will come into the, oh, I'm sorry. You will come into the Agnes Schneider Terrace. Um, it is surrounded by our American perennial garden. And this area plays host to a bunch of different events throughout the year. We have a picture here during our spring bloom season, looking back on our visitor center. And speaking of spring blooms, we have over 300,000 spring blooming bulbs. So they usually peak around Mother's Day and that's a great time to come out to the garden and see the beauty of all these bulbs. The maple foam patio is kind of the focal point of the terrace and it provides a relaxing place for resting and it's kind of a meeting place for the upper garden. This picture here is taken again during our spring blooms and you can see the Adirondack crab apples. It's one of my favorite places of the garden in spring and when those trees drop their blooms, it's like being in a little spring snow globe. It's really beautiful. Alongside the terrace is the um, Cheryl Wellhouse and Garden. The lower of the portion of this building houses our wellhead pumps and mechanics while the upper portion of the garden provides some shady relief from the summer sun some spring blooming pictures as well here. The well house offers a look down into our lower well house gardens and herb gardens as well. And here's a picture from those lower gardens looking up into the well house. Across from the well house is the Vanderperen English Cottage Garden and it features the Meredith Rose Cottage. And in this garden is planted a mix of herbs, vegetables, um, perennials, and old fashioned self-sowing annuals. It's a favorite stop for visitors. A lot of people come in here to take pictures. Also off the Schneider Terrace past the fountain is our Cress Oval. And the Cress Oval is a perennial garden and it's really a blaze of color and texture throughout all seasons. It is presided over with by a bronze statue of George and Marguerite Cress donated by the Cress family for who the garden is named. And this is a favorite wedding spot in the garden as well as picnics and other activities that go on here. You can see in the center of the picture, the is our stump Belvedere. And this is a open gazebo that offers a view to our lower gardens and some of the other natural areas. It has a ceiling that's cut out with a moon, stars and clouds representing the sky above. Through the crest, you can also enter into our Lux Foundation Upper Rose Garden. And this garden is home to hybrid tea, grandiflora, floribunda, shrub, and antique roses. And it's filled with amazing color and fragrance throughout the growing season. Focal point of this garden is our loose house and the Captain Loose House, rather. Um, it's styled after a typical Scandinavian three season summer home. It is surrounded by windows on all sides, letting in a ton of natural light, and it's a great spot for a small wedding or shower or any type of celebration or gathering. And then from the Crest Oval to the south, you can kind of see the arbor there in the middle. Um, this is our Vietnam Veterans Garden. It's a zero scape garden, so it's planted with perennials that thrive without much water or fertilization. And, offers visitors kind of a more sustainable way to garden. So you follow this path down along, we'll take you to our lower gardens. We have an amazing children's garden here, the Gertrude B. Nielsen Children's Garden. It's a family favorite, it visit, or the entrance will greet you with a koi pond. We have a lot of different activities for children and adults, we have a large Treehouse with slide, that is a favorite. We also have a large sundial that's surrounded by the colors of the rainbow. It also has a small 
butterfly rearing house and many other playful and educational opportunities. We are in the works of planning the expansion for the children's garden and we're hoping to great break ground on that in 2022. So stay tuned for that. This area is also home to the Les and Dar Stump Hobbit House, which main function is a restroom and water station. Um, it's built into the hillside here and you can see the green roof. So that makes this building both energy efficient as well as playful. Across from the children's garden is the King's Shade Garden and this award-winning garden houses a limestone spring house ruin, which is a great opportunity for photos. It also has a meandering creek trickling through and this garden is full of shade trees, hostas and other shade loving perennials. That brings us to the Jenkins Pavilion, and this sits in a natural clearing. Um, the structure itself is built out of salvaged barn timbers, and it offers a panoramic view to the upper gardens. If you look, you can see on the left, way back here, that is the Captain Loose House in the Rose Garden, and to the right, you can see the um, Belvedere Gazebo Overlook. The latest addition to the garden is our Donald J. Schneider family garden. Um, this garden hosts an amphitheater. We have two summer series of concerts. Throughout the year, we were lucky enough to be able to carry on with one of those concert series. Even though we were dealing with social distancing and COVID, we were lucky enough to be able to do that because we have such a large space. The building to the left there is our catering kitchen, or I'm sorry, our concessions building, which has room for classrooms as well. And this garden is planted all native plants and cultivars of native plants. So it provides a great habitat for wildlife. And here's a picture of visitors enjoying a concert on a beautiful summer evening. So that is the last garden on my part of this tour and I will hand things off to Jean. Thank you, Kate. You did a great job overviewing the botanical garden. I would like now to provide our viewers with an overview of the uh, dwarf conifer garden. Um, the slide that you're looking at right now is the, is, an entrance, is the entrance to the conifer garden. The garden was built in three phases. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, the garden was envisioned in 2005. Um, every garden, er, every year after that, uh, we purchased dwarf conifers uh, for the future garden. The garden became a reality when construction was initiated in the spring of 2013. The garden was built in three phases. Phase one is colored in blue, phase two in pink, and phase three in orange. In phase one, construction went smoothly, but plant installation, however, was very challenging in the middle of a very hot and dry summer. The second phase of the garden uh, was initiated in the spring of 2015. Construction, uh, uh, while this construction was completed th that spring, garden planting has been ongoing and will be completed in the spring of 2021. Like the first phase, the site's nice blend of sun and shade conditions has allowed a diversified selection of conifers to be purchased and installed. Phase, uh, phase three of the, of the garden um, was completed in the summer and spring, of, or spring and summer of 2020. This portion of the garden is small in size, but large in impact with an interesting contemporary water uh, uh, feature included in the garden. 
By the summer of 2021, the Dwarf Conifer Garden will contain 545 different cultivars, representing 113 different species and hybrids in 15 different genuses. This does not include an additional 175 mostly large conifer cultivars spread throughout the rest of the conifer, or, uh, rest of the botanical garden. This slide, or this sh uh, slide shows uh, an inventory of the conifers in the garden uh, summarized by genus. Not surprisingly, almost 50% of the garden's genuses and associated cultivars are either Picea or uh, Pinus. There is, however, a very good representation of all of the other genuses that grow in our 5A hardiness zone. To facilitate access to all of the conifers, the garden has gravel paths that meander throughout the garden. All of the gardens are labeled with genus and species and cultivar. Educational signs um, are included throughout the garden. Reference garden status was granted to the garden um, in the spring of 2015. Perennials are included throughout the conifer garden, which makes it a for, which makes for a very beautiful spring, summer, and fall show. I would now like to take you on a virtual tour of the conifer garden, highlighting plants that I am particularly fond of for a variety of reasons. The signet, whoops. What do I get back to that? The signature plant, um, the signature plant of the garden is a meta sequoia called Gold Rush. Although not a dwarf, it does make a statement as you enter the garden. Gold Rush was purchased for the garden in 2009. The next conifer on our tour is a prostrate uh, golden juniper. Uh, named Gold Strike. It should not go unnoticed that Gold Strike is planted just in front of Gold Rush. It was also purchased in the garden for, in 2009. Its color and growth, are, gro growth rate are unmatched among yellow prostrate uh, junipers, in my opinion. My next featured plant is a Camiciferous thioides heather bun. With a growth rate of less than two inches per year, it makes a great dwarf conifer addition to the garden. Heather bun has a great shape and texture. It's the only thioides that has been successfully grown in the garden to date. If you're looking for a hardy and reliably winter burn free, fine needled Alberta spruce, Picea glauca, Blue Wonder would be a very good choice. It has been in the garden since 2009 with no, uh, with zero winter damage. The Pinus ponderosa species has been a challenge to grow in this garden. We currently have two dwarf cultivars. Jerry's Pride, which has been in the garden since 2015, is the best performer. Its growth rate has been less than one inch per year. I love Doug firs. There are currently 10 dwarf cultivars in the garden. One of my favorites is Fat Doug, which was purchased in, in 2008. Its growth rate is about one inch per year. This conifer truly lives up to its name, having a wide girth and a short stature. The first abbeys, um, the, uh, the, the first abbeys, I'm highlighting today is Abbey's Nordmania Hunwell WB. While this plant is given a cold hardiness rating of 5B by the American Conference Society, it has been thriving in its garden since 2010. The next plant on our tour, Larex Marshall, Lin Mer <laughs> Marshall Linsai Umhausen, is a cross between two large species like Eucalyptus, Eurolepsis, and Siberica. It is my understanding that the specific two species creating uh, this hybrid are unknown. 
Pinus sylvestris wateri is my favorite dwarf conifer. This plant has been in the garden since 2005. Since its purchase um, for the garden, it has never been pruned uh, and has, a, uh, has grown no more than six inches. This sylvestris cultivar also does not suffer from pine scale and gypsy moth infestations, which are both so common with this species. Picea pungens mississicerini is a new addition to the garden. The plant grafted on a standard. Uh, standards are great in this conifer garden because uh, they add height to the garden and they can also be easily underplanted uh, with growing perennials. The next conifer on our tour is Pinus rigida shermanetti. As a cultivar, it is not often found in conifer collections because I am told it's a very difficult plant to propagate. This is a very beautiful specimen of, of that plant. The Abbey's Fargus species, in my, in, in my knowledge, uh, has no cultivars. Fortunately, the species is a very slow grower and therefore a welcome addition to this garden. If you like golden cedars, this Occidentalis gold drop is in my mind, the very best golden cedar cultivar. The cultivar, cultivar is very bright and permanent. In addition, it has a very pleasing form. Although it is on the high end of the dwarf conifer growth rate, it is easily pruned without any loss of color. It is truly a beacon in this uh, garden. Abbey Cephalophilus Myers Dwarf is another zone 5B conifer that is thriving since 2013 in this garden. It is a very handsome plant. Thuyas, for the most part, have not lived up to my expectations. They're underachievers. The whole, the, the white ones aren't, aren't white. The ones who are supposed to be weeping don't weep or not very well. At least Thuya canadensis Golden Duchess is kind of an exception. It's sort of yellow and it has a nice form. Like all Thuyas, it does well in shade and that certainly is a great attribute for any conifer. I like the Juniperus Guatama species. Most of the cultivars are quite colorful. The cultivar Floriat is no exception. It also has a very slow growing it's also a very slow growing juniper, which makes it a perfect choice for the garden. There are very few juniperous Virginiana cultivars that have a dwarf growth rate. Gray owl is an exception. It, it's very distinctive color makes it a great uh, plant for this garden. The next conifer on our tour, Pinus edulis fancy Nancy. I like because it just doesn't grow. Since becoming a part of the garden in 2016, it has not grown more than one inch. It's another of the five B zone plants that are thriving in the garden. Hugo pine is an exceptionally hardy conifer group. Unfortunately, they are uh, magnets for pine scale and gypsy moth infestations. There is uh, currently a moratorium on Pinus mugo purchases for the garden. Pinus mugo pot of gold on a standard is the best of the mugo pines in the garden, principally for its golden color. Something that never ceases to be exciting is the occurrence of conifer seedlings in the garden. This Juniperus virginiana seedling is growing directly under Pinus mugo pot of gold. It will be relocated to the phase three portion of the conifer garden in spring. There are currently seven other seedlings growing in the garden that we are monitoring. The Pinus aristata species does not have many cultivars that are available. Currently, we have two aristata cultivars in this garden, and I'm always on the lookout for more. Pinus aristata Joe Bess has been in the garden since 2013 and is a very slow grower. The next plant on our tour is Picea rubens HB. It is at the fringe of its hardiness zone in this garden. Its slow growth and neat form make it one of my garden favorites. Abbey's grandis cross concolor Lutergarii 
is another of several hybrid conifers that can be found in the garden. It is clear to me that the con color portion of the hybrid gives it its hardiness. The Abbey's grandest cultivars have so far not been viable to us. With this hybrid, at least we have sort of a grandness in, the, in our garden. Camiciferous obtusa cultivars can be quite unique in form and many are very colorful. The problem with them is that they're just not hardy in our area, or not, not reliably hardy anyway. Camiciferous obtusa crispy has been in the, uh, is, has been an exception. It became a part of the garden in 2009 and has had no hardiness issues uh, to date. The cultivar pretty much, uh, the name of, the, uh, of this cultivar pretty much describes its uh, appearance. There are a lot of Juniperus chinensis cultivars, but not very many that are dwarf in size. Juniperus chinensis Kaizuka variegata not only has dwarf growth about two inches a year, but is also extremely attractive with its white variegation. Yellow conifers really stand out in a conifer garden. When a yellow conifer does well it's in shade, that makes it all the more valuable. Pinus orientalis tom thumb, which right now is green, but uh, in the summer, in spring and summer, it's yellow, uh, is one such plant. This conifer actually needs shade to perform at its best. Another conifer that has that is stretching its hardiness zone in this garden is Pinus Jeffrey Jopi. The American Conifer Society has this conifer rated at hardiness zone eight. Jopi has been driving, uh, thriving in this garden since 2009. It is an extremely slow grower. My favorite Pinus nigra dwarf cultivar is Black Prince. It's been in the garden since 2009. This plant has grown no more than one inch a year. With its thick, long green needles, it has a very stout appearance despite its size. I love finding bald cypress in any garden, much less a dwarf conifer garden. In this garden, we currently have three dwarf cultivars. They're all rather exotic in appearance, uh, but the one that I like best is Pivet Minaret. Its columnar shape makes it a standout in the garden. Unfortunately, its fall color, uh, unlike other bald cypresses, leaves something to be desired. Another plant in this garden that is stretching uh, its hardiness limit is Pinus strobiformis loma linda. Again, the American Conifer Society's hardiness rating on this plant is zone eight. Many vendors list it as a zone six plant. In the garden since 2015, it has grown no more than one inch in the past six years, uh, but, it has also, but it has performed very well. A larch that has unusual prostrate form is Larich Camfranini Pivet Tunis. For this reason alone, the larch deserves a place in this garden. That it is also a very slow grower makes it even more deserving. Whoops. Oh, crap. I got the wrong. One more. Here, there we go. Thank you. Um, I don't know if ginkgos are still considered to be a conifer, but they have their place in this garden. There are currently seven dwarf, uh, dwarf ginkgos growing in this garden. The slowest grower is one called ginkgo biloba troll. Because its growth rate, it is best grown as a standard in order to appreciate its uh, shape and its dense bran uh, branch structure. Pinus cimbroides stanley's pyramid has been thriving in the garden since 2013. Its growth rate has been less than two inches per year. The final plant I would like to show you on our garden tour today is the Abbey's Magnifica Elba. It has a great shape and color, and I have not seen it growing in any other uh, gar uh, conifer gardens uh, that I have toured. I hope you have enjoyed your virtual tour of the Green Bay Botanical Gardens Dwarf Conifer collection. 
Our primary objective is showing our visitors what conifers will grow in our area. We are also uh, striving to maximize our plant diversity. When, we get to the, when you get to the Green Bay Botanical Garden, please stop by and check out the other 510 cultivars in the garden. Kate and I will now answer any questions that you might have. If the co-host will look at the chat window to see if <clears throat> the questions are in the queue, we can give them to Kate and Jean. Well, Gene, I had a question on the coloration of the heather bun. In, in Wisconsin, does it get really plum purple colored in the winter? Uh, yes. Uh, when I took that uh, earlier picture that was on the screen, it, it really hadn't uh, uh, secured that color yet, but right now it's a very beautiful plum color. Okay, uh, from Jeff and Jennifer Harvey. Uh, oh, they they mentioned where you can get uh, plant engraving uh, plant tags. And then from Jeff and Jennifer also, yes, also in the south gets well over eight feet. That's Heather Bun. Jeff? Yes, heather bun for us gets very large in the south, um, but it's a great plant. I mean, I'm sure it does different things based on heat and growing conditions. Yes, here it's, been, here it's been growing very slowly. It's, it's been in the garden a long time to uh, see, and we haven't sheared it ever. Yes, we thought um, it was Byron, work too. <laughs> okay, Byron also asks, how does snow cover affect your zone reading of plants? Uh, excuse me, could you ask the question again? Sure, Byron asks, how does snow cover affect your zone reading of your plants? Well, uh, we love to see snow cover. We got a little bit right now. Um, but it does, it does vary considerably from year to year. Last year we had a very heavy snow cover and, and uh, we still lost uh, about 20 plants. Um, most of them are not by plants, most of them are zone four or zone three. Um, as far as uh, um, the hardiness, it really doesn't, I don't think it makes a whole lot of difference given the variation that we have in snow cover each year. Well, then let me follow up to that, Gene. Many of your plants, you seem to be successful in pushing the hardiness zone. Is there something you can attribute that to? Well, we, um, we try a lot of them, <laughs> and some of them work, <laughs> and some of them don't. Uh, the ones that, uh, that I showed today have, have been very uh, successful in our garden to date. But it's just a matter, I, it, I mean, I put in other uh, um, conifers that are zone five that just didn't even make it through the first winter. So we do a little testing here. Pinus Lumbergii, Pinus Lumbergii Thunderhead, for example, didn't make it through the first year. I'll ask you about your, your water eye. It was a beautiful plant in, you had in the slide. And you said it seemed to have immunity to, to the doggone scale. Uh, for the plants that you have to treat, how do you deal with scale? Um, we were using a soil drench, just a really basic bare soil drench. And this last summer we switched to tandem and that seemed to really improve um, lessen the population quite a bit. I think our timing may have been a bit off. So that's something we're trying to nail down exactly and, you know, get 
on that at the exact times. I think three times a year we'll be doing it from now on. Well, we have about, I would say we have about 20 uh, plants in the garden that we're currently uh, having to deal with uh, pine scale on. And um, we've had to throw probably uh, three conifers away because the, the scale has just gotten out of control on them. Um, but as Kate said, uh, this treatment that we're using right now seems to make a big difference. And, and we haven't really had to dispose of any plants uh, for this problem since we started using it. Uh, Bradley Allen asks if you grow any conifers in containers. No, we don't. Um, uh, that may be something that we do in the future, but right now uh, I'm not aware of any conifers that we are uh, growing in pots. Um, another person asks, as your plants grow into each other in the future, will they be pruned, transplanted, or removed? Uh, the objective is to keep them in the garden as long as we possibly can. And for that reason, we do prune. Um, some of the conifers that are really, really slow growers, we have not pruned at all. Um, some of the other ones uh, like the uh, uh, Thuy occidentalis that I showed you, gold drop, um, we are gonna prune this spring uh, to keep it uh, in, in, in control. Uh, but our, our objective is not to prune unless we have to. And at some point, uh, plants will need to be moved to other parts of the garden. We won't throw any out. And John uh, Chapin also asks, is needle cast a problem with Piscea pungens in your area? Here in the central Indiana, uh, 5B, 6A, the regular pyramidal varieties are really suffering, but the various varieties like prostrate uh, prostrate gubosa are as badly affected. Oops, I meant that the various varieties are not as susceptible. <clears throat> we found that uh, to be the uh, also. The uh, we do have some pine uh, needle needle uh, blight uh, on our on our. Uh, pungents, but this, it, and it, but there aren't any in our garden in the in the dwarf conifer garden. They, they show up, or the, the disease shows up in the larger conifers. I have yet to see a problem with any of the dwarf conifers that we are that we have in the garden. They just don't seem to be as affected. In fact, they haven't been affected at all to date uh, by that problem. <clears throat> and we have a lot of pungents. And uh, uh, Mike Weber wanted to know the name of the drench that you use for pine scale. It's called Tandem, T-A-N-D-E-M. Okay. Do you know what the active ingredient is? Um, I don't off the top of my head. If he wanted to send me an email, I can find out that information for him. Mm -hmm. And Sandy Hefner asked, what was the cultivar of Pinus ponderosa featured? Have you seen an increase or decrease in visitors in 2020? Uh, you asked about the, the, con the ponderosa conifer name? Yes. Uh, I'm going to look it up here. Oh, Paul Jerry's pride. We also have a high, uh, high desert. Um, it's not doing quite as well. Uh, it's had, it did have problems with, uh, uh, the, with the needle uh, or with the pine needle scale. And uh, it's, it's recovering from that. Um, but Jerry's Pride is definitely a, a, a really good uh, ponderosa cultivar. And what was your second question? Um, what the attendance? What? Attendance. Oh, they wanted to know if your attendance for 2020 has increased or decreased this year, this past year. Well, it definitely has decreased, but um, we're lucky being in, with 47 acres, there's plenty of room for social distancing. So I think after a while, 
you know, we were closed for a bit right off the bat, but then after a while, people started coming out because it was a safe place to social distance. We also hold our largest fundraiser is called Garden of Lights. It's a Christmas botanical light show. And with um, timed tickets, we were able to pull off that event really successfully. So, you know, we definitely didn't suffer like other businesses and places, but it was a slower year. And I also had mentioned we were able to hold our one of our concert series that we run through the summer. So we were able to get away with doing some of our regular activities and we did get people out to the gardens, but, sl but slower than most years. And uh, Bradley Allen asks, of all the 500 plus conifer cultivars in the garden, what is your favorite? Oh, that, that's water eye. Vina sylvestris water eye, I love that plant. An absolute beauty. That it does not, I have yet to have any disease issues with it. It's, I have it in my, at my home as well. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mark Conlick says, we have had a decrease in visitation due to being closed during the uh, safer at home order and limiting attendance to our butterfly exhibit. <clears throat> Laura also asks, do you have a deer problem? And if so, how do you manage it? Occasionally, we'll get a little deer uh, grazing. Um, probably about the fourth year in, uh, in the dwarf conifer garden, we had a number of um, uh, ewes that were chomped pretty good. And as a result of that, I moved them in the garden so that they're all over. Uh, and, as, and so we haven't had any more problems. Uh, apparently the deer can't sniff out the ones where we put them. <laughs> but it did make a difference. It uh, really, make it, trying to put them all in one spot just really set the deer up in really good shape. Sandy, thank you for raising your hand. Would you please unmute? Well, I just wanted to, the, um, Sherry posed the two questions that I had asked. Uh, thanks, Byron. Okay. Okay. And um, Laura, no, I'm sorry, I asked that already. Uh, Sandy asked to everyone, what do you use for mulch? Just, we, we use just uh, um, uh, bark chips, shredded bark. Mm hmm we would expect that that will start to decline. In fact, it, it's already starting as the plants get larger. Um, we don't need to put it underneath the plants. So uh, there's less and less of it being used each year. Okay. Uh, Mark Conlick says, uh, we also wrap some of our more deer susceptible, larger conifers like Suya occidentalis and taxis in other parts of the garden. And he also says you use shredded hardwood mulch. Yeah, so far we've been lucky. We haven't had, we have not had to uh, cover up any of our, uh, we have a couple of, the, of, of cultivars that are fairly new or fairly young. And we will occasionally, when we're pressing the hardiness zone, we will cover uh, those with burlap for the first year. I think we've got maybe, what, three or four in the garden right now that we've got burlap on. Okay. And John Chapman asks, uh, did I miss it? If you fertilize and what do you use and when? We don't use any fertilizer. We want these plants to stay small. <laughs> Therefore they don't get any fertilizer. In other parts of the garden, we do use a um, slow release fertilizer or malorganite but in the conifer garden, we generally do not fertilize at all. Do you find that uh, milorganite helps deter the deer? I think it does to a point, you know, it's hard to gauge that, but it does say that it is, that's one of the things that it is supposed to help with. So we have deer and chipmunks throughout the garden and a lot of them. So I, 
we don't have too much damage considering, so it may contribute. Um, let's see. And then San, Sandy Huffner asked, during the Garden Art Exhibit, will there be any special programs as part of that exhibit? I'm sure there will be. I am not. Um, we have an education department that handles a lot of those things. I don't know all of the up and coming um, events surrounding that exhibit, but there definitely will be. We do a lot of things for both children and adults. And all that information can be found on our website as soon as it's available. It'll be up on the website. Yeah, Mark Conlet writes, yes, there will be some programming around it, especially one camp. Is that for kids? The camp would be for the children, yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I wonder if I wonder if uh, any one of the gardens is the most popular, perhaps the children's garden, et cetera. Um, I think certain areas, you know, we have such a diverse collection. So the children's garden definitely is one of the most popular areas when we have, you know, the events going on, the grand garden is where everyone gathers. And then a lot of we've got, I wanna say, five to seven different wedding spots. So those are popular areas as well. Are there any further questions? Yeah, did you want to tell me? Dave has a question. I was just wondering if you could comment on your Magnolia uh, collection. Yeah, and do you have problems with Magnolia scale? I understand that is a big problem this year throughout Wisconsin. We, yes, so the area you see here, the Grand Garden, that's where the magnolias were originally planted. So they have been moved to another area, which unfortunately you can't see here, but it's off to the right-hand side of this screen. Um, they, so we have some that are a little stressed from being moved, but overall they're really doing really well. Um, two years ago was the first time that we found Magnolia scale. So we've also been doing a soil drench for that as well as manually removing them from the trees. I, I understand you have quite a variety of magnolias. We do. I think we have the largest um, collection hardy. of cold hardy ver or magnolias in, in the country. Yeah. I can't tell you how many off the top of my head. Mark might know. Yeah, there's over 120 different magnolia species and varieties in that collection. And it is pretty significant, especially of Dennis Ledvinda's hybridizing work, who was a hybridizer that actually lived in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and was internationally known for his work. So it's pretty exciting. And um, random interesting thing, I had an email this morning from Todd West, who's a hybridizer at North Dakota State University and was um, we're, is going to start working, I guess, on an update to Michael Durr's Woody Landscape Manual and, you know, look at information from North Dakota State and the Morton Arboretum and asked if Green Bay Botanical Garden would be willing to, like, share our interesting information about the plants that we're able to grow in our cold hardiness zone. And, of course, we said we would be willing to share that. So probably some of Jean's awesome comments on conifers and our magnolia information, we could help um, update that manual with the cold hardiness information that we've been collecting over the years with the, the collection of magnolias and dwarf conifers and other trees and shrubs on the ground. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, Jay and Tess Park asked, what is your soil type and your normal pH? Do you acidify? Mark, do you wanna speak to that? Um, pretty much everybody could speak to it, but our so soil is actually pretty good. Like it's not clay. It's really a nice sandy loam in most spots of the gardens. We do have a couple pockets of clay, like strangely in that upper rose garden, there was like a huge clay lens that we augered through when I first started. And then um, we actually have pockets that are like pure sand, um, probably from glacial deposits would be my guess. So um, it's actually pretty good garden soil and also all of the mulching, the wood chip mulching over the years that's broken down and decomposed and been added to the soil makes it really good 
um, for growing plants. Our pH is a little bit um, kind of on the higher side. It's like neutral to a little bit um, above that. Like I think when we did testing in that Grand Garden area, that used to be the Magnolia collection, like Kate said, and that was up to a pH of 8.0. So not ideal for Magnolias, you know, which like it around six and a half, seven. So we tried to do some, um, you know, like kind of pul pulverized sulfur and things, but it's fairly difficult to change the pH. So we kind of just work with what we have um, and don't really try to change the pH so much. But you can see all these conifers are thriving in the area that we have. Um, so we just work with what we have. Okay. And Mark, uh, somebody asked if you could repeat the hybridizer going uh, to update door. Yeah, um, I probably maybe I shouldn't have said that because it's not le legitimate information. But um, his name is Dr. Todd West, and he's actually a professor at North Dakota State, and he is just um, he's a hybridizer of all kinds of plants there, and he's just going to um, I guess you know collaborate to give information on northern hardiness um, to the update to the manual. So. Maybe I shouldn't have said anything, but I was so excited that I had to share it with everybody. So keep it on the down, we'll cut this part out of the presentation, maybe. <laughs> Too late. Um, John Tepman also asked, do you have Bracken's Brown Beauty Magnolia, which is the hardiest of the Southern Magnolias? It does well here in zone 5B. Um, yeah, you know, um, we're kind of like getting out to the magnolia from dwarf conifer, but we did have Br Bracken's Blonde Beauty, but that one actually did pass away at Green Bay Botanical Garden. And the one that we have of Magnolia Virginiana that's the hardiest is actually um, Moonglow or Jim Wilson. That's the one that's been the hardiest for us up here. Okay. <clears throat> Um, oh, uh, Jacques uh, says, I think they would be better served growing Thuya canadensis ever it's golden, an older cultivar, but much better gold, yellow gold color. Uh, golden Duchess presents itself in our garden in Southeast Michigan, just as pictured here, not earning its place in the garden. Yeah, but I still like it. Yeah. I have uh, it in two spots, and it's not doing too badly. And I also have the Golden Duke, and that's doing well. Did you say Everett, did you say Evergold? Everett's Golden. Oh, Everett's Everett's Gold. Okay. Yeah. Anything I can do to update my my uh, or improve my Thuya collection, that would be great. Yeah, it's I got it from Mitch Garden uh, Mitch Nursery years ago. The uh, that's about 30 years ago, and the, they're about nine feet tall, so they're pretty slow. Uh, I moved a couple a year ago uh, this past fall um, because they were they'd gotten they overgrown yellow. and they were uh, very green, but right now they're just screaming yellow. Mm. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yep. I think that was the last question in the chat. Are there any more questions? In fact, Kate, if you would go ahead and stop the screen share, we can see people's faces on the screen. So you can just, you can do like uh, Sandy did and raise your hand. Thank you, Steve. He's got a thumbs up. That's for the presenters. They did a great job. Thank you for having us. Thank you for, for uh, complimenting. In fact, in, in, the, uh, in the participants window, there are a lot of thumbs up and applause symbols. So thank you all very much. Last call for questions and then we'll have some announcements. Are there any more questions? Okay, there'll be none. We'll have a few announcements. Mr. Speth, 
Would you care to update Iowa? Okay. Um, 